I want now to move in a very different direction and looking at topic six, which has to do with Adam and Eve. As we know, Genesis 1, 2, and 3 in the Bible describe Adam and Eve. Those three chapters are extremely important in understanding the Christian worldview, the biblical worldview. When I used to teach world religions at Kenyatta University in Kenya, um, I would spend about half of my course in the Christian section in that course um, on Genesis 1, 2, and 3 because those, those chapters uh, are very, very pertinent in understanding who we are as human beings. Uh, so we won't spend <laughs> days on it today, but we will look at it rather carefully. And likewise, the Islamic understanding of the primal family, Adam and Eve, is extremely important in understanding Islamic theology and the mission of the Muslims in the world. And there's divergence. There's convergence, but there's also divergence. I mentioned today how that the um, uh, Imam in Nairobi that reviewed this Bible study course for Muslims was so chagrined by chapter 3, which talked about Adam and Eve, uh, the fall, you see. Why was he so chagrined about that? Because within Islam, we're basically good. Adam made a mistake, but it was a rectifiable mistake. It could be... It could be uh, uh, forgotten. Um, he's basically good, you see. Um, whereas in the biblical account, Adam and Eve turn away from God and we experience sinfulness, and so we need redemption. Within Islam, we need instruction. Within biblical faith, we need redemption. And the divergence between those two understandings is planted right within the accounts of what happened in the garden. That's why that Muslim theologian was quite upset by the suggestion that we need redemption because of our sinfulness. Another Muslim one time uh, told me after an evening of dialogue in a large mosque, um, the next day he said, I was just very, very upset with your description of Adam and Eve in the garden. And for him, he was upset because I talked about how when Adam and Eve turned away from God, God enters the garden and meets them hiding behind the bush. Now, why would that be so offensive for my dear Muslim friend? Why? In Islam, God never meets us. He never comes down and meets us. Within the Quranic description of Adam and Eve in the garden, God sends his will down. But God never comes and meets Adam, you see? But in the biblical account, God goes and searches for him in the garden and finds him hiding behind the bush and meets Adam and Eve there, you see. And so we see within the stories there is convergence, but there's also divergence within, within the accounts. So let's look at point two uh, here in our outline. And by the way, as we go into this, let me just mention that the readings for this chapter would be Journeys, chapter 3, this book here, chapter 3, and the dialogue would be chapters 2, 3, 4, <laughs> the big, big reading, 2, 3, and 4, and 14, 15, and 16 in the dialogue. 2, 3, and 4, and 14, 15, and 16 for this chapter. It's a lot to read there. So, in the Quranic account, Adam and Eve are created, Adam is created in paradise. And interestingly, God breathes into Adam his spirit. Now, what does that mean? Well, Katarega, in the dialogue, says that what it means for Adam to, be, to receive the spirit of God is that he has the ability to discern right and wrong. Secondly, he has the will to choose. And third, he has the authority to make use of creation. And fourth, he has the power of speech. And Katarega says there might be more dimensions to it as well. But this is the consensus of most the Muslim theologians, that these four dimensions 
of what it means to be human come about within our experience by God breathing his spirit into us. Now, Adam is created not on earth, but in paradise. <clears throat> and um, Adam, uh, and, and Satan, by the way, uh, is not happy about Adam having been created. He, uh, he says, in fact, he says to God, Adam's going to just do mischief. And um, he's not happy about that. But God goes ahead and creates Adam anyway, against the advice of Satan, up there in paradise. And then God teaches Adam the names of the animals. So God says to Adam, that will be called a crocodile. My God didn't speak English, did he? But we'll just pretend for a moment. He says, that'll be a crocodile. And Adam says, crocodile. And he memorizes it just like that. He's so terribly intelligent. And Satan is trying to remember these names, and he keeps forgetting them. You know, <laughs> five minutes later, he forgets that it's a crocodile. But Adam remembers. And so uh, Satan becomes terribly, terribly jealous. And he determines to mess things up. So it's because of Satan's jealousy that he seduces Adam to take the fruit from the tree in the garden in paradise that he is not to take. So he makes this mistake. So God then sends Adam and Eve down to earth from paradise. You see, so the original creation is not on earth. It's, it's in paradise. But when Adam makes that mistake, God sends him to earth, not as punishment, but he sends him to earth to be tested. And when he arrives on earth, he arrives uh, in the plains of Arafat there, where, um, where Mecca is today, in the vicinity of the Black Stone. That, that's where he arrives when he gets to earth. And so, as mentioned earlier, God sends Islam now down to Adam from paradise. Now, the Islam he sends to Adam is not recorded in a book. It's an oral instruction that God sends down to Adam to instruct him on how he should do uh, and what he should believe. So Adam receives this instruction, which is Islam, which is, by the way, the same instruction that God sent down to Muhammad thousands of years later, you see. There's no change. It's simply further clarification every time uh, a prophet proclaims Islam. It's simply clarification of the original Islam that God sent down to Adam, which is to say that the reason we live on earth is to pass the examination. I work in this course here. They've asked me to do 100 multiple choice questions for this class. Imagine that. 100. It's 16 pages of examination questions they've asked me to do. And I, I spent all last evening working on it. And without mercy, they said, you must keep on doing it until it's finished. If you can't get it done while you're here, then you do it after you get home to America. You know. this, this class has an examination at the end of it. Well, God also has a class that he's arranged and a curriculum. And uh, the curriculum is Islam, you see. And the teachers are the prophets and the imams. And at the end of the day, there'll be an examination to evaluate how well we have done in obeying that curriculum, in learning it and in submitting to it, you see. That's why they memorized the Quran, the whole thing. That's the curriculum. They memorize it, you see. That's how seriously they take it, memorize the whole Quran. So the curriculum has become part of you. And, um, and then at the end of life, why, there'll be an assessment of, of whether you pass the test or not. And that will determine your eternal destiny, which is to say that 
We come from paradise to earth. Why do we come to earth? Why have we been sent to earth? Why was Adam sent to earth? So that he would have an opportunity to submit to the curriculum, which is, being in, which is the instruction sent down by God. And when he faithfully accomplishes that curriculum, why he will then be taken back to paradise. So it's from paradise to earth, back to paradise, when you pass the curriculum. If you fail the curriculum, then you go to hell, you see. So the purpose of living on earth is to submit to the curriculum, pass the test. Which means history is really going nowhere. It's a parenthesis. You come from paradise to earth to return to paradise. And why are we on earth? In order to pass the curriculum, to pass the test at the end of life. That's the purpose. That's what we're here for. And God is checking us out. Are you going to pass the curriculum or not? In fact, there's, like I said earlier today, there's two angels, one on each shoulder, watching how we're doing in, in, in relationship to this curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yes? Good and bad angels, or both of them good? They're both good angels, but uh, the, one is, the one gives particular attention to recording the, um, the, the bad that you do, the other, the good that you do. Yeah. But they're good angels. Oh, yeah, yeah. You want to, that's why after the prayers, you'll notice that they greet the angel on this shoulder and on that shoulder. You want to stay on good terms with those angels that are keeping account of how you're doing. Mm -hmm. kind of, not in our culture, but kind of like in the Western culture. Sometimes they say it's a bad angel and a good angel. They okay. one tell you one thing, so they tell you another thing. But <laughs> this is different with the Muslim, right? I mean, that's a different idea. Right. My understanding is that they're both good angels. You know, they're messengers of God. But they, they didn't tell you what to do, they just recorded it, right? They recorded it. Mm -hmm. Telling you what to do is, is the core. You see, yeah. yeah. Now, on Earth, uh, Adam is supposed to be the caretaker of the Earth and uh, take responsibility for, um, for the good Earth. And um, they are the servants of God uh, to, to submit to His will. And our natural inclination is to be Muslim. That's very fortunate. Their natural inclination is to submit to the will of God revealed in Islam. That's, that's natural. It's, not, it's unnatural. Um, so um, our human nature lends itself well to that, to that commitment. Um, now, the biblical account, Adam and Eve are created on earth, not in paradise, on earth. And uh, they're created in God's image. What does all of that mean? Well, it means a lot. <laughs> it certainly means that our fullest humanity is to live in a right and joyous relationship with God. And it certainly means we have the ability to commune with God and to receive and comprehend the thoughts of God. And it certainly means we have the authority to have dominion over the earth. To care now, dominion means don't destroy it, but care for it and develop it, even make it better. We have authority um, to, um, to name the animals. And certainly it means that we're living souls who live eternally. Um, we, we, uh, God has granted us, has created his image, um, eternity in our souls. We, we are not just, death is not the end of the story. Those are some dimensions of being created in God's image. There's certainly more as well. Now, God teaches Adam and Eve, I'm sorry, God gives Adam and Eve the responsibility to name the animals. Now, within Islam, who names the animals? God. God. Within the biblical account, who names the animals? Adam. <laughs> so God says to Adam, okay, you got that responsibility. And so Adam says, uh, okay, we'll call that a crocodile. And I'm just imagining here, so God's off to the side, saying, okay, well, all right, it'll be a crocodile. You know, and this, well, we'll call this a donkey. Okay, it's a donkey, you see. And so Adam names the animals. Now, naming it has to do with having dominion over and authority over these animals, you see. You see. Um, yes. I, I assume after Babylonian Tower, we have to rename the, all the animals again, right? Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, yeah, but we have that authority. 
whether you're speaking Russian or English, we have that authority. Yeah. <laughs> I like the Islamic description of Satan. He has even less memory than Adam. Probably he can forget about our mistakes and iniquities. It's, it's great. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. Now, Adam and Eve make a choice to turn away from God by taking fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That tree means many things, but certainly one of the things it means, I think, is nature. And you know, within modern society, we have elevated science to become our God. You know, that all that we know about good and evil and so forth comes to us through science. Science is the study of nature, isn't it? It is elevating nature to become our final authority. Well, that happens right at the beginning of human history, where Adam and Eve venerate the tree more than the creator. The knowledge of good and evil come from the tree, come from nature, you see? And that's the whole roots of nature divinities and polytheism and all of that kind of thing, including scientism, which says that science is our final authority. It is venerating the tree that comes from nature rather than God the creator. And so in venerating nature, we're turning away from God and, uh, and uh, making ourselves or, or the tree become the final authority. And as we turn away from God, we experience sinfulness and death. And so God enters the garden and meets Adam and Eve there, and he makes this astonishing promise in Genesis chapter 3, 15, that a son born to the woman will crush the head of the evil one. He will be wounded in the process, but he will triumph over evil. There's his Satan, the, serp the serpent, is a symbol of evil and sinfulness and rebellion against God. And this son born to the woman will come and with his heel is going, to, is going to stomp on the head of the evil one. <laughs> Destroy him, you see. But he'll be wounded in the process. And I believe that is a uh, promise which is fulfilled in John 3.15, 3.16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That this son that God promises to Eve and to Adam <laughs> is fulfilled in Jesus the Messiah, who has indeed stomped on the head of Satan, but wounded in the battle. And that's what the cross is all about. So within the Muslim movement, God sends his will down. Within the biblical account, God promises a son will come to deal with evil. Interestingly, in both Islam and the Bible, God clothes Adam and Eve with raiment. Now, Muslims say that raiment, raiment of righteousness, is what the Quran says. I will clothe you with raiment of righteousness. What Muslims say that means is it's Islam. God sends Islam down to them, and they're to clothe themselves in this instruction that God sends down, you see. Within the biblical account, God actually slays an animal and gives them the skin of the animal, which I believe is a sign of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus that took place many, many centuries later, you see, in which as we believe in him, we're clothed in his righteousness through his atoning sacrifice. And that animal slain in the garden back there at the dawn of human history so that Adam might be clothed in that skin is a sign pointing toward the one who yielded his life for us many, many years later. Have you benefited from this teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting TVS with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. I would like now um, for us to look through point four, where we have a contrast in comments in relationship to the Quranic, um, um, uh, Quranic teaching about Adam and Eve and the biblical account concerning Adam and Eve. And um, what we're going to do is just go around the room and each of you read these points. So we'll start right at the front here with Vitali. The Quran says, and then the Bible says, you would read it, 
Sometimes I will interject then with a comment. But let's just look at these comments, which are comparison between the Quranic and the biblical accounts. Uh, 4.1, right? Yes. Adam created in paradise, he is sent to earth for a time of testing. Adam and Eve created on earth, created to glorify God and enjoy God forever. Okay, let's each one read the, the two together. Was, okay, so, so go, I, I, that, that's four, fine. Good two. point two now. So mm -hmm. Quran says, God breathed his spirit into Adam, and Adam uh, is the caretaker of the earth. Okay. And the Bible says, God breathed his spirit into Adam and Eve, and they are in God's image. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The back. God named the animals. Adam named the animals. Now, that speaks of authority, you see. Within Islam, God names the animals. Within the biblical account, Adam names the animals. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons, this understanding, this theology, that much of the energy of the Muslim movement goes into um, the exploration of Islamic law, you see. Because God not only names the animals, he gives us instruction about every area of life. Whereas in the biblical account, God takes the enormous risk of entrusting us with those responsibilities, you see. I think this is one of the reasons that in Christianized societies, there is so much emphasis on science, for example, you see, because we're commanded to explore and understand the earth house put together. We have that authority, we're to name the animals, so investigate it, explore it, you see. I don't mean that Islamic societies are anti-science, no, but the, the energy tends to go into exploring <laughs> Islamic law and how we apply that to every detail of life, you see. Who names the animals? Who has that responsibility? Forms our understandings of our responsibility in relationship to creation very significantly. Uh, Adam made a mistake. We are all naturally good. Adam and Eve turned away from God and became sinful and experienced death. We are all participate in sinfulness for in turning away from God the image of God in whom we are all created and distorted. Yes, the, the, the great, great tragedy of our turning away from God, which is described in Genesis chapter 3, the alienation, um, even parents and children alienated from each other, the children born in pain and so forth, the, the great tragedy of our turning away from God and how all cultures uh, reflect that tragedy. Every family is touched by this tragedy. Number five. God, Quran. God sent guidance uh, to Adam. That guidance is righteous uh, clothing. Bible. God promised to send a son to redeem us from sin. God clothed Adam and Eve with the skins of animals, a sign of the atonement for sin that we have received in Jesus, the Lamb of God. All right, thank you. Number six at the front again. Quran, God and Eve worshiped God at the Kaaba and submitted to his will as the first Muslims. Bible, God met Adam and Eve and confronted them in the garden. It says Adam was the first Muslim prophet and the Bible says Adam and Eve were created for fellowship with God. Okay, and number eight. Quran says, the Kaaba was where Adam first worshipped God, and that is the direction all Muslims turn toward in prayer. There is no movement forward toward the future hope. The Bible says, God meets us wherever we are, and so there is no geographical prayer center for Christians. There is promise and hope calling us forward as we anticipate God fulfilling his promise of redemption. Within, within Islam, as I said earlier, history is a parenthesis. And within that parenthesis, we are 
to submit to the curriculum that God has sent from heaven, Islam. And so that's what the energies of life should be invested in, learning how to submit to that curriculum. It's a parenthesis. Uh, there's no movement forward. And even in prayer, you face that Kaaba where Adam first worshiped God at that black stone. You see, you face that, you see, a sign that 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 is the center. There's no, there's no forward movement. Whereas in the biblical account, history begins in a garden and where it says climax, a grand city, <laughs> you see? It moves, that, that, that grand city in Revelation 22, 21 and 22, it comes to earth, you see? It's heaven come to earth, the kingdom fulfilled on earth. And so history's all moving towards this grand finale, the great city that God is building, you see. Starts in a garden and consummated in a city. And the biblical accounts, the biblical narrative is this grand story of God moving, calling forth the people in pilgrimage, facing that great city. We don't face back to Adam and say, oh God, we want to just submit to what Adam was all about. No, no, no. We're moving onward towards that grand plan that God has when Jesus returns and the kingdom is fulfilled forever and ever, you see. And Jesus is, is, is the presence of that kingdom. When he, comes to, when he came to earth, he was, he was the, the full revelation of that kingdom, which will be consummated when he comes back again at the conclusion of history. So in our prayers, we pray, brothers and sisters, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, that kingdom that will be fulfilled, which is described in Revelation 21 and 22, Lord, may it begin to happen right now in our midst, you see. It's a call to movement forward. History is going in a direction. It doesn't just hang in a parenthesis. It's moving forward, you see. Yes. But I assume... What do you explain the Christian way? As we're looking for the heavenly Jerusalem. It's yes. in heaven. So for Muslim, the earth's life also going to be ended. Yes. So they go to heaven too. There'll be just the two movement, one's here and one there. Yeah, but in, in the biblical account, it's, it's um, God recreates and redeems the earth, you mm -hmm. see. He doesn't obliterate it. He recreates and redeems the earth uh, in the consummation of this grand city, which comes to earth, the city comes to earth, yeah. Revelation 21. Mm -hmm. But this earth is going to be burned out? Well, the, his, well uh, the, the, the burning up of the earth, if you look at Peter very carefully, it, it, the elements, it refers to the demonic spirits and so forth that will be judged in fire, you see. But the earth itself is going to be uh, uh, recreated, redeemed. You know, it's, 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 it's all messed up with sin and so forth now. But in the grand plan at the conclusion of history, this earth will be redeemed and renewed and we're going to reign with Jesus. <laughs> we go to heaven, but then we reign with him, you know. Yeah, yeah. We will reign with him eternally. Yeah, no, no. Revelation 21, it says, the city comes to earth. John, go up and they say, look, it's coming to earth. You know, it will be redeemed. The curse is no more. Yeah. Well, there's where we get into discussions on eschatology and so forth. But the point I'd just like to make is that within Islam, history hangs in parentheses. Within biblical faith, history is moving forward towards a grand conclusion when Jesus returns and the kingdom is fulfilled forever and ever. Um, yeah, but Islam yes. is a conclusion, so it's also in heaven. Is this going to be in this earth or somewhere else? Well, in, in, in Islam, we're on earth for a period of testing and then we go to paradise. Okay. Yeah. So this also kind and of then, then the whole earth burns up. It is no more. Yeah. For there's no more need. There's no more need in Islam for an earth because the test is now finished. We go to paradise, you know. But in the biblical account, uh, the city comes to earth. <laughs> Revelation 21. Yeah. Read it there, I, you know. I, I, God, I, I, God. Might not, I might disagree with you, but <laughs> so I believe this earth is going to be burned to kind of like Muslims. So we're going to create a new heaven and new earth. That's what's the idea of God to take it up. When Jesus went up to be with mm -hmm. Father, mm -hmm. so he went up to be someplace not earth, right? So when we will be taken with Jesus, it's also going to be not earth, but someplace else. But yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter much. I mean, <coughs> if God totally renewed this earth or something. Yeah. yeah. I think the point we, we want to make, and we may have some disagreement on, on all of that, but um, the point is 
that in biblical, in biblical faith, history is moving towards a grand plan yeah, at the consummation of all things in Jesus Christ. We're not looking back to Adam living within a parenthesis. We're on a journey, and God is at work to bring about his kingdom, and that's what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Lord, may your kingdom come now as it will be fulfilled at the end of history when Jesus comes back again. So it's a call to movement, to cultural transformation, to a journey toward God's grand plan when all things are consummated in Jesus. Yeah. And I agree. We have like an Old Testament, New Testament, some kind of like a changes, new it's covenants, movement, and everything. It's, a movement. Yeah. it's, it's yeah. always. I mean, we might yeah. disagree. What's going to be in the end? Where yes. we're going to be? But yes. it's really yes. different here. The Israelites than the church time. Mm -hmm. Then, then again, it was just. It's really yeah. interesting. And this is one reason. Wherever the church goes uh, and proclaims the gospel, it becomes a movement for cultural transformation. You see, uh, <laughs> for Jesus calls us to be transformed. Okay, let's, um, um, let's conclude. In Islam, the world is a schoolhouse filled with good children. All we need is instruction and leadership. Within the Bible, the world is a hospital in need of a doctor so that we may be healed and recreated. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.